In Christ's name, amen. Amen, amen. We're starting a new series starting today, and it's on worship. It's titled Worship. And uh, we're going to be in this for uh, today and then three more weeks. So we've got four lessons out of God's Word on worship for you. And um, let me start with a little bit of a story. Some of you guys have heard this before. I grew up in a really traditional home. And we were right here in the second pew. So a pew for you non-church folks, um, a pew is like literally a slab of wood and you sat on it like all together, right? Like so we sat on a pew and our family had our pew and I knew where I sat in our pew every single week and we would sing the hymns and you had a hymn book in front of you. You'd stand and you'd sing the hymns and it was awesome and I love the hymns to this day. They're precious to me. But I remember one particular Sunday, and we're sitting there, we're singing the hymns in our pew, and behind us, out of this corner, I could see some movement. And there was a woman who had stood up and was moved by God. She put her hand up. What's she doing? (laughs) It's not what we do. She's charismatic. Okay, but that's not us, right? Like, I I come from a German family. We don't emote, okay? (laughs) And and, and so I I knew from a young age, like, like, I'm really not on that team. And so... I get older and, and I give my life to, to Christ and, and um, I get radically saved and I start, I start opening up every single part of my life up to God. Like, God, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And eventually it would come around to worship. Um, but I was still kind of stubborn about it. And I remember there would be times and, and I'm in the worship service and the music is going and, and, and I'm entering into the lyrics and, and God moves in my heart and I'm, I'm like, I'm feeling it. And what would start to, and my, my hands would start to like, like they wanted to go up. But no, I'm, a, I'm, I'm German. I don't emote. I'm, 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 like, I'm, not, I'm not on that team, right? Like I just, I would, I would stop. I would stop it. And I remember there was this time where uh, Linda and I went to this church, and it was a Christian Missionary Alliance church, and there was this pastor there, and, and he just knew God's word, and he was, he was awesome, he had an awesome heart, and like I knew how to apply God's word to my life, and I was just being really challenged, loved this guy, and we were there for just a summer, as all, all the longer that we got to attend that church, and I remember during the singing time, like we'd be way in the back, and because uh, we always came in late, because we couldn't wake up early enough, amen, anybody, right, like... But that was just us, and, and he would be in the front row during the singing time before the worship would start, or before the uh, sermon would start. And he's not distracted. He's not thinking about what his first line is going to be. Instead, he's in the front row, and his hands are straight up. And I don't mean like he's like one of these swaying guys. He's like, he's not that. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but that just wasn't him. They're just up. And you could see it from across the room. And I was challenged by that. Still didn't emote, though. Wasn't ready. I remember there was this time Linda and I were trying to learn about marriage and and what it was to have a relationship when we went through that book on the five love languages. And some of you guys have been through that. We talked about it at the, uh, the recent family series that we did. And the idea of the love language is all about the fact that some people receive love better uh, in different languages. Like some want quality time more and some want gift giving more and some want physical touch more and things like that. And, 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 and the big idea of the love languages book is not just the, that the languages exist. It's the fact that we often want to give love in the way that we prefer, but that's not really the issue. The issue really is... How, how the person wants to receive love. And so you've got to kind of stop what it is that you want to give just long enough to say, how do they receive it best from me? And that that's real agape selfless love. And so anyway, so we're in church and it's like, it's one of these moments again, the hands are kind of trembling. It's like, no, I don't want to do it. And, uh, and God comes in and says, you remember that love languages idea? Maybe it's not so much about the kind of worship that you want to bring to me. Maybe it's about the worship I want to receive from you. And maybe that should define what you bring to worship and not so much the team 
that you grew up on and the tradition that you come from and all of it. And I switched teams. God help us. I switched teams. Amen. Amen. In the New Testament, some of you guys have heard this teaching before, but there's multiple words uh, for, for the word love in the New Testament in the original Greek. And there's all these different words, but in the English, we only say love, right? And, and, and it, it's imprecise in the English language. We, we say, I love my kids, and I also love Doritos, amen? <laughs> like, I love both, but it's not a very precise way to describe the two different feelings because they're two very, very different feelings. But in the New Testament, they've got multiple words for love and they've got, they've got eros and they've got storge and they've got phileo, phileo and they've got, they've got agape and, and, and there's friendship love and there's family love and there's, there's, there's sexual love and there's, there's agape, selfless love like God has for us and we should have for God, agape. And so we know that in the New Testament and, and, and we need to like even study deeper so that we know which love it's describing to us because it's not translated into our English Bibles. And in preparing for this worship series, uh, one of the big light bulb moments for me personally was that uh, it's kind of the same thing with worship and praise in the scripture. That we just say praise God, but in the Old Testament, if you go into the ancient Hebrew, there's over nine different words for praise. And worship is actually this very kind of complex idea. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's not that it's intimidating, it's that it's rich. There's more than just singing in praise. And so we're going to dig into that across this entire series. I'm actually going to take the, kind of the structure of the series is I'm going to take multiple words from the original Hebrew and we're going to look at those words and what kind of praise it's talking about there so that we get a truly biblical, well-rounded idea of what praise and worship is actually supposed to be. You ready for that? It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. So let me just define this just really, really quickly. So praise first in the English language. What praise means when we say that word, it's not a genre of music, right? Like next to my country western like playlist, I've also got worship playlist, right? It's not a genre of music. Praise is this idea. It's this bigger idea of every time that I want to lift somebody up and I want to exalt them. I want to show respect to them in my words or actions. I'm praising them. If I want to express gratitude to them for something that they've done, I'm going to praise them even for who they are sometimes. I'm going to praise them. That's, that's the idea of praise. And sometimes we get screwed up in the church because praise becomes kind of this buzzword. Praise is the singing time before the sermon starts. It's not even though hopefully we're praising during that. But that's not the limitation of what praise is supposed to be. So let's look at this very first word in the, in the, uh, in the Hebrew. It's halal. Say halal. Halal, you just spoke Hebrew. Good for you. Well done. Halal. Halal is this, this word. It's used all throughout the Psalms, and it fills especially the final Psalm, Psalm 150. And halal means this. It means to be clear to praise, to shine, to boast, to show, to rave, and to celebrate. There's so many different ways that this particular word can be used in the scripture. I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. Psalm 149 verse 3 says it this way. And, and again, you're not going to see this in your English Bible, but it's there. Let them praise or halal his name in the dance. Let them sing praises with the timbrel which is a percussion instrument, kind of like a cymbal, and the harp. So they're singing, and they're dancing, and there's instruments. There's even beat. God help us. There's a beat to the music. Psalm 150, and this is the last psalm in the book of Psalms. It says, praise or halal the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. What he's saying there is praise him in the sanctuary. That's God's house. That's the church. Praise him when you're in church, but also praise him everywhere else. In the highest heavens, praise him everywhere, no matter where you are. That's in the car and in the shower, amen? Praise him even there. 
Verse 2, praise or halal him for his mighty works. Praise his unequaled greatness. Praising him for his mighty works, you know what that means? That means praise him for the things he's done in your life. That's the works. But sometimes you're like, I came to church today, and I don't feel like God's done anything for me lately. And that's okay. Praise him for his unequaled greatness. Praise him for who he is that day. Like, like the blessing may be on its way. I'm praising you for who you are. Love that. Verse three, praise or halal him with a blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and the harp. Praise or halal him with the tambourine and the dancing. Praise him with the strings and the flutes. This is a full band worship. Praise or halal him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. So it's not just quiet. It's also loud. It might get loud. Verse 6, let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise or halal the Lord. The last line in there, he says, it's cool if you don't feel like praising today. Let's just have the people with a pulse praise. Are you breathing air? Just you guys. You praise. Everyone praise the Lord. Halal, you might recognize that a little bit. It's where we get the word hallelujah. You grew up hearing hallelujah. So that is halal in its plural plural form as a command, an imperative. That's David saying, let us all praise. And then the yah at the end, the jah at the end, that is a version of Yahweh, which is the God of the Bible, the one true God who created the universe. Let us all praise Yahweh. Every time you see the word hallelujah, that's what it's saying there. It's a sentence. Every time you see the word hallelujah, it's a sentence all on its own. You're learning Hebrew. How's it going, class? You doing all right? Yeah, hello. Let's compare that to another one. This one's Shabbat. Say Shabbat. Shabbat. I just love the sound of that one. So Shabbat means to shout, to address in a loud tone, to command, and to triumph. So this one's got a different vibe to it, doesn't it? Like I'm going to shabak, I'm going to yell. Psalm 106 verse 47, it says, Save us, O Lord our God. Gather us back from among the nations so we can thank your holy name and rejoice or shabak and praise you. So you didn't even know that was there, but it was there. Psalm 145, 4, let each generation tell, or Shabbat, its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. So what it imagines here in this particular verse is it imagines moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas are sitting down with the next generation and saying, let me tell you the stories of the Red Sea. Let me tell you the stories of what God did, not just in our nation, but in my life as well. And when you tell it, tell it with passion. Shabbat. Right? Tell it like that. There was a time when the Ark of the Covenant was stolen from the people of Israel. And the Ark of the Covenant, if you ever saw Indiana Jones, right? Like that's how we learn the Bible from from movies. Um, So the Ark of the Covenant is the big gold box, right? That melts their faces off at the end of the movie. It's a great moment. Um, But anyway, the big gold box. So that was a real thing. It didn't melt anybody's face off, but it was a real thing. Um, And God's presence was there. It wasn't a magic or mystical box. It was that God loved his people so much, he wanted to communicate, he wanted to be near them. And so he said, I'll allow part of my presence to come and indwell this crazy golden box. And that was in the Holy of Holies, and it was this big, holy thing. But God's presence, the point was, I love you enough, I want to be in the middle of the camp. And so the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by their enemies, the Philistines. And it was just this huge moment. You just can imagine the pain that they went through, that God's presence had been stolen away from them was kind of the way that they would have seen that. And then it was brought back, which is a super fun story, and you should read it on your own. But when it's brought back, this is 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 5. Watch this. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming back into the camp, because they got it back, Their shout of joy was so loud that it made the ground shake. Imagine a moment like that. It made the ground shake. That's Shabbat. You may be sitting here today and you're like, okay, here we go. Worship series. Pastor wants me to sing like a charismatic. No, I don't. 
just sing like an Old Testament Hebrew. Okay? Just bring it like an Israelite would bring it. All right? Bring it like that, and then you're all good to go. Have you ever been to a sports stadium before? You ever go to the game? And what do you do at the game, right? You shout, right? Like you got the clothes on. Like you're set. You paid money to be here. You're pumped, right? Like when they play the music, you sing along. Some of you dance. You do. You dance. You get all into it. Your heart gets all into it, right? You're a little bit idiotic at the game, are you not? I'm just a little bit idiotic, little bit foolish, and that's all part of the fun of it, right? And like when they score, what happens to your hands? Oh, touchdown, like everybody is, right? But at church, we're like this. Why? Like, well, I'm a reserved person. Uh, Ah, you're just reserved at church, right? And you got to ask yourself why. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you why. You got to ask yourself why. Some of you even cry at the game. My daughter and I went to a 21 Pilots concert. It's a band and, and she was all into that, that uh, band and so we got the tickets, and I don't even remember. I think it was a birthday present. And so I'm about to go to this concert with her, right? And, like, I don't want to be the dumb dad who doesn't know the music. And so I get out onto YouTube, and I'm, like, watching all this concert footage, and I'm trying to learn the songs and all this kind of stuff. And then we finally go there, and we show up, and we got all the garb on. And, and, and you know, as soon as the first note of the song starts, like, we're up, you know? And we're singing along and going crazy and doing all the stuff. And, uh, you know, and we're having a good time. And I remember behind us was this, this couple, this young couple, and they're both sitting down and they never stand up and they don't get into anything and they don't sing along. And it's, it was really clear that she, the girl, kind of wanted to, but the guy didn't. And so they kind of sat there the whole time. And the whole time we're doing all of our stuff and we're kind of looking behind like, oh, poor couple. <laughs> poor, sad couple. You know, at one point she says to me, she's like, they paid the same amount for their tickets as we did. Just not having the time. So that's something to this worship thing. Are you having the time? It's supposed to be enjoyable. You go to the, what, that wedding reception, right? And there's that little cheapo dance floor out there that they put up. And that DJ, like he's being paid money and his whole job, right, is to try to crowbar people onto that dance floor. Right? Whatever he's got to do just to get people on the dance floor. Why? Because the more people come onto the dance floor, the more people are going to have fun that night. And why are we so stubborn about not wanting to get on the dance floor? There's something about us, isn't it? Part of the human experience is like, why do we fight all that stuff? Just some things to think about. When David, King David, became king of Israel, there was a moment, and it had been King Saul, if you know the story. If you went to Sunday school, you know the story. But it's like King Saul had been the king for a long time. He was kind of a bad king, and things did not go well. And David was crowned king. And one of the first things that he did when he became king is the Ark of the Covenant. Back to the gold box again. The Ark of the Covenant was in another town. It had been stored somewhere else. And David, one of his first acts as king, is he wanted to bring that to the capital city of Israel. It was a way to honor and glorify God. It's like a statement. He wants it to be even closer to him. And so he has this moment where he brings the Ark to the capital city. And this is 2 Samuel 6.1. You've got to watch how this happens. It says, then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all, and he led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. Now, the thing I want you to notice in that first part, it's 30,000 people. Don't read the rest of this passage and think 20 to 30 people involved. 30,000. You can't find places that'll seat 30,000 people. This is, this is a huge crowd. 
This is a roar around this crowd. And David gathers this many people unapologetically because of the priority of this moment to bring the ark to this place is an act of worship for David. See 30,000 people involved. And look at what they're doing. They placed, verse 3, the ark of God on a new cart to honor him, and they brought it to Abinadab's house, and David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord. Look at what they're doing, singing songs, playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres and harps and tambourines, castanets and cymbals. 30,000 people losing their minds. Huge crowd, full band, it's on, right? Can you imagine that scene? Jump to verse 13. And after the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone just six steps, David stopped everything and sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf because it was worship for him. And David danced before the Lord, and he didn't just dance, he danced what? With all his might, wearing a priestly garment. And so David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and the blowing of ram's horns. He danced with all his might. This is not Lawrence Welk for you old people in the room. (laughs) This is not chill. Dancing with, I mean, he's going for it here. Dancing with all of his might. And there's a shout of joy and the blowing. They're having a good time. This is fun. This is a fun day. This is the kind of day you want to be a part of a day like this, right? They're having a good time. Okay, when David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. And she said in disgust, how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any other vulgar person might do. Now in the text there, it indicates he might have gone without his shirt as he was in the midst of all the excitement. And so she's calling him out and saying that was very vulgar for you to do. How dare you dance with all your might there? Now a little bit of backstory. Michael is David's wife. And not only is she David's wife, but she is King Saul's daughter. King Saul is dead at this point. And she grew up in the palace. She grew up with some money. She came from some money. She came from some comfort. She came from a situation where everything was a bit prim and proper. Formal occasions. We knew how to act in these different scenarios. This this wacko David clearly does not know how to act. That's what she's saying to him, right? She's saying, it's vulgar what you're doing. It's shameless what you're doing. It's It's a very, very complicated moment between David and her. Let's keep reading. Verse 21, David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and all his family, and he appointed me as the leader of Israel, the people of the Lord, so I celebrated before the Lord. Now, this is a complex moment, isn't it? Are you reading these words? He says, God chose me, and he didn't choose your father. Just just a little little marriage tip. Don't mention the in-laws. Hardly ever, hardly ever. It's a bad idea. So he made. <laughs> all, all these moments are complex, aren't they? But so it's complex, and it's complex between them. She married him. God did not choose for the kingly line to continue through Saul, chose for it to continue through David instead. But he's married to her. They were in love. They're husband and wife, and she calls him out. Maybe there's a little bit of jealousy in her. Maybe this is complicated for her. Maybe it's, it's not just about the way that he was dancing. Maybe it was about more. But still, she misunderstands his expressive worship, right? So I'm going to draw this principle out of the text. Sometimes when we are expressing ourselves in worship, people misunderstand us. And sometimes... When you've seen other people be expressive in their worship, you've misunderstood them. So there's that. The second part is, he says there's a why behind his worship. There's a reason that he's out there dancing the way that he is. 
and it's, it's not so much about Saul. It's the fact that God chose him to be king. The fact that out of all the people in the world, God selected David. And that selection felt like love to him, felt like honor and respect to him. And he's worshiping God for that. That's a really, really big deal. So look at verse 22. He says, and I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to, the humili- even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servant girls that you mentioned will indeed think I am distinguished. So Michael, the daughter of Saul, remained childless throughout the rest of her entire life. I did not want to read that last verse to you today. But I knew some of you guys were going to read ahead and you'd want to know anyway. So I figured let's just drive into it because it's the last verse of the chapter. Why in the world is she childless? Now there's a lot of possible reasons, but this is one of these moments in the Old Testament. You got to be really, really careful because it doesn't say why. Now you could say, well, hey, the whole way that the drama unfolds, it certainly feels like this. And I don't know. And maybe you're right. Maybe this was some kind of judgment for the fact that she was judging him. It does not say in that verse, read it closely, it does not say that God judged her and punished her for her words. It doesn't say that. One other possibility is it may be that this was such a break between her and her husband. And this fight, this conflict, this moment of jealousy here, they may not have been romantically and sexually connected from that point forward. And therefore, she did not have any more children. It's complicated. Just wanted to address that. The big thing we're supposed to get out of this, though, is that David had a reason. He had a why for his worship. He says, it's because God chose me. Now, I had to study this because that really, really surprised me right there. It surprised me of what he called out because David, you might know, had done a whole lot of things in his life. He had defeated Goliath, right? Like, why isn't he sitting there and saying, I'm celebrating dancing before God because God helped me survive against a giant. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say because God crowned me king today. He doesn't say that. All the battles that David fought and won on behalf of God's people, that God was faithful to him in, all that stuff he could have thanked him for. He doesn't. He says, God chose me. He's actually pointing to a moment that happened when he was a teenager. I had to study this. I had to get my timeline all down. Because when David was a teenager, that's when God sent the prophet Samuel to his house. And of all his brothers who were older and taller than him, God said, take the runt of the litter called David. And that's what happened. And you choose him to be king. And like I said, I had to get the timeline out. He was, he, he was somewhere between 15 and maybe 18 years old when that moment happened. And in the very next chapter, after he's selected king, he goes up against Goliath. And he wins against Goliath and he has faith and he stands for God and he stands for the name of God in that moment. But he got chosen as king before Goliath. Before he did anything for God of consequence, he was chosen to be king. That means, follow me here, that means it was a choice based on grace. It was a choice based on who God selected, not based on what he earned. He didn't earn anything with God up to that point. God just, out of everybody, said, you. And and, and that had been sticking with David this entire time. And so a couple years later, he fights Goliath and wins. And then all the battles happen. The text tells us he waited 15 years to become king, finally become king. He was chosen an anointed king when he's a teenager. He's 30 years old before he finally becomes king. And he waited all that time. And when he finally brings the ark in and he dances before the Lord, it's because you chose me when I was a teenager. What's the why of your worship? Why do you sing? Why do you shout? Why? Because that's what matters. What did God do in your life that makes you a worshiper? Because we can talk this entire series about what kinds of things. Well, what about raising hands? And what about shouting? What about crying in worship? What about all these different things? 
none of that stuff really matters all that much. We're going to talk about it. It's going to be fun. But the big deal is what's the why of your worship? Because if you walk in here on a Sunday morning and you know what your why is, you'll worship different. You might find yourself being a little bit foolish, a little bit humiliated, a little bit undignified if you know your why. Do you connect the dots? Or is this just the singing time? We got to connect the dots, amen? What's the why of your worship? When I first got saved, I'd been this religious kid, grown up in this religious church. And it's like so much good stuff had been poured into me, but I never made my connection to Jesus and I didn't love him. And if you know anything about my story, you know that while I was going through the teenage years, I ran away from God. I lived my own life, did not care what my lifestyle was doing to Jesus at all. Just didn't care. Like a lot of people. But I had been a hypocrite. I had taken the name Jesus, but I didn't live for him. And when that reality hit me and I was radically saved, I cannot tell you how low I felt. Like we're raised in America and we have rights and we have the Bill of Rights. Like you know what your rights are. You're an American, amen? Do you know what your rights are? Of course you do. And people fought for those rights and we're thankful for those rights. But man, when this hit me, I had no rights anymore. Not before God. Like if he wanted to send me off to Africa, he could send me off to Africa. Because he owed me nothing. He had saved me from everything. And I didn't earn any of it. And, 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 and nobody t- can teach you that. I knew it down in my soul. Every single day, I knew it in my soul. I knew what I had done. I knew what I had done to him. And when he still saved me by the cross of Jesus Christ, nobody was more thankful than me. And when you get that, and when you live like that, And then he says, worship me like this. You're like, whatever, sign me up. Sign me up. That was the why of my worship. A month or so ago, my mom finishes her chemo and her last radiation. And they declare her a survivor of cancer. How do you think I worshiped that Sunday? Because God wasn't just God. God was the God who had saved my mom. What's the why of your worship? Do you, has God done anything for you today? Has he done anything for you this week? What's he done for you this year? What's he done for your kids? What's he done for your family? What's he saved you from? What's he rescued you from? How many times did you almost crash the car and an angel pushed you back into the lane? For some of us, quite often. <laughs> it goes on and on and on, guys. You walk in on a Sunday morning, you got to know the why of your worship because you know the why of your worship. It changes everything that you're about to do. I'm worshiping because, and I'm singing the lyrics, and when I'm singing the lyrics of the worship songs that they give to me, what are those lyrics doing? They're turning into prayers between me and the Father. I'm at the throne. And when I'm at the throne and I'm giving him these prayers, he's connecting all those lyrics and all those truths to different things in my life. God. And sometimes the tears come, amen? Sometimes the tears come and sometimes it's a shout. But what's the why of your worship? Now sometimes we got this inner gatekeeper inside of us. I've got one. Have you got the little emotional gatekeeper that says, nah, don't go there? Like I told you, I'm like, I'm a a German. I don't emote, you know? I don't cry. I I, I just don't very often. And it's like, and I remember growing up and it's like, and there'd be movies, right? And people would be like, you got to go see this movie because everybody cries at this movie. Don't you love it when people say that? Then why would I go watch that movie? (laughs) No, you got to go see it because everybody cries, which is code for they're going to make you love the person and they're going to kill him at the end. (laughs) And then everybody's going to bawl, you know? Like, that's the idea, but I like going to those movies. Okay, okay, okay. And it's like, and then you're getting near the end of the movie, and people are like looking over at me like, is he he crying? Is he crying? So dumb. But what I learned early on, because I want to be this strong man, you know what I mean? Like, what I learned early on is I got this this little gatekeeper 
on my emotions. And like I'm watching the movie, and you're getting kind of caught up in the person. You're getting kind of attached to the person. It's like, no, nope, don't do that. Why don't you hold back? Think about something else. Get distracted. Like, pull back, pull back. Because you're going to cry later. Don't, don't let it happen. And that gatekeeper, that, right? Yeah. Right? You've got that. And we obey that gatekeeper. And a lot of times we say, well, I'm just being natural. I'm just being who I am. Are you? Or you let that guy have his way. And is that, is that the best version of you that you're supposed to be? I don't know that it is. Because God made you a very specific way. Like here we are in this church, right? Like we're different ages, we're different generations, we're different. I mean, we're a, we're a melting pot kind of a church. We're a non-denominational church. You came from all different kinds of backgrounds. I know that. You, like you're, you're from all over the country, especially you soldiers. You're from all over the place. We're different races in this room. And based on, those, based on those races and based on your culture and your ethnicity, it's like you come to the table different. Like we don't know each other at that level. But are you taking what God made you to be and are you shutting it down? And when you come to worship, do things get to a point where it's like, ah, I might be a little bit foolish. That might be a little bit weak. That might be a little bit undignified. I better shut that down. Not David. David's like, I'll be more undignified than this. You haven't even seen what I'm capable of. <laughs> I love it. There's this woman that once that came to Jesus and, and she worshiped Jesus, right? And it's this scene and it happened inside of a Pharisee's house. And she pours out this just exuberant kind of worship to Jesus. And there's this Pharisee standing by and he starts to get mad that she had done this. And he asks Jesus about it. And Jesus says in Luke 7, 47, I don't have it on your screens, but listen to this. He says, I tell you her sins and they are many have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who has forgiven little shows only a little love. Love. Jesus says, it's cool, dude. She just happens to be one of the people I'm going to die for. She's got a lot of sin. So she loves a lot. You think you've only got a little sin. So you're only going to love me a little. What camp are you in today? Are you a little sin person? Are you a lot of sin person? Because I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care how much of a leader you think you are in the church or are in the church. Jesus boils it down to, have you been forgiven a lot or a little? Because if you've been forgiven a lot, then bring a lot of worship. No gatekeeper at all. Amen? Why should you give God your foolishness? Why? What has God done for you? See, the next several weeks, we're just going to keep going through this. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea uh, on what you're going to see in the next three weeks because we're just going to keep challenging you. I met with our worship leaders this last week. I met with Amanda Young and Josh Cuse, and we sat down and we walked through this series together because they are, I don't know if you know this, but they are pastors of you up here. Like, they are leading the worship as much as I'm leading the worship during the message, okay? They are pastors. We trust them. They are empowered by God. We love them. So I sat down with them and said, you guys need to help me really figure this out, how we're going to do this series. Because I want this series to be a challenge for us. Because there's steps that we all need to take. Are you going to be foolish? Are you going to praise God with some undignified praise? And he may ask some things of you, right? He has in every other area of your life. And he's going to push you. And when he does, how are you going to respond? And guys, these steps can be really, really tiny. Little baby steps. Each week, little baby steps. But can you come to next week's message with an expectation? I'm ready, God. I'm ready, God. You come and challenge me now. I've, 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 maybe I even think I've had this figured out, but I'm going to let you challenge me. Let you push me. I'm going to respond to you. Can you come with that kind of an expectation? All ready to go. That's what I'm asking. And let's talk about what some of those baby steps might be. Because it's not, 
The dream, guys, is not we get to the end of the series and everybody's hands are up in worship. That's not it. There's, God is doing different things in every single one of you. For some of you, it's going to be, I'm going to show up to church on time for three weeks in a row. Amen? Like, that's what I'm going to do. It's going to be awesome. We're going to do a thing. Starting next week, the rest of the series, we're going to flip the services on us. So we're going to have one song up front. We're going to do announcements and stuff. And then we're going to get to the message. And we're going to learn more about worship. And then we're going to have most of the singing time at the end. We're going to have three songs at the end. Because you're going to learn some stuff and then get to put it into practice. All right? So we're going to do that the rest of the series. We're also going to do some stuff that's meant to stir your ability to worship at home, in the car, in the shower, wherever you are. So we sing some great songs up here. So we're going to create a Spotify checklist with all the songs that we sing at church on it. And we're going to give you guys a QR code in your programs next week so you can get straight to that and you can listen to our church's music, learn the lyrics, get more prepared for Sundays. That's what we want for you. So we've got several things coming like that. This is really going to be a special, a very, very different series for us. Amen? Get challenged. What does God want to do in your life? Maybe your step is you're going to come and you're going to sing the lyrics with your whole heart. You've just never done it before. Maybe in the past you were just kind of getting through the singing time. Now you're going to give these as gifts to God. Some of you are going to bow. You're going to get on your knees. Us, us, us younger people, for sure. You might shout a little bit. Who knows what might happen? Some of you might get quieter. That might be your step. I know that sounds opposite of everything that I've said. But the heart of worship is that you would get out of your box and give God what he's asked for, right? Some of you guys, when you're in the room, myself included, you can be the center of the room. Talk a lot. Draw the spotlight to you. And maybe it's your role at work. Maybe it's just your personality. And maybe when you come to church, your normal mode is to still put the spotlight on you in worship. And God's going to come and he's going to challenge you maybe to quiet down. God's going to challenge you maybe to do an audience of one kind of a thing and it's all on him. I don't know. I'm not going to define it for you. You've got to hear what he has to say to you. Last question, last question. Why does God care? We're going to be talking about this the whole series, but I'll give you one. Why does God care? Why does God want David to be undignified? Why does he want that? And why does he want it from me and you? There's a scripture that says that when the saints pray, it says that the prayers of the saints rise up to heaven like incense burning. And it says that the Father in heaven, he takes that in. It brings pleasure to his heart. Did you know that? It's like a gift to him. God, you've given me everything. Everything I could go on and on. But maybe my worship is a tiny gift back. Not that it's going to earn me anything. Just some pleasure to you because I love you. Amen. Would you guys stand right now? Let's pray. You're, when you're driving to lunch... Are you hungry yet? Everybody okay? When you're driving to lunch, sometimes you ask each other this question, right? It's like the most natural thing in the world in the car. How was worship today? How was worship? How was the message? How was the singing? How was worship today? Were they on key? Did they pick the right songs? Did they pick the songs I like? And we ask ourselves these questions and we give ourselves permission 
to ask these questions. And we're kind of consumers and we're kind of evaluators. Could I just ask you for the rest of this series, don't give yourself permission to ask that question. Take it, take it away. Instead, change it to how was your worship today? And put the focus on you and God, how'd it go? Still talk, still ask the question, but how did your worship? It's not stage, it's you, amen? Let's pray. Lord God, I pray for our worship. And I pray, Lord, that our connection between us and God over the next several weeks, Lord, that you would stretch us, that you would grow us, that you would challenge us. Lord, take us to a new place, God, because I believe that part of what you're gonna do, this heart surgery you're gonna do in us, in this realm of worship, it's gonna make us different people. God, you want good things for us. I pray that we would come each week from here on out expecting great things in Christ's name. Amen.